Thank you very much for being here to hear my presentation. It's an honor for me to uh, have the opportunity to give a conference in this such a, a very uh, international consortium in different industry and academia to help everybody um, in science in general. But uh, something funny here before starting my presentation is that I pretended to talk to you about a different thing related to this topic. But um, uh, fortunately, that work is being, uh, it's currently under editorial processes, so until it's published, I cannot disclose anything about it. So I will talk about it. Uh, something related with that, but um, uh, with a different focus. So what I want to do with you in this talk is please uh, think, about chem think about chemistry from a different perspective, not from the traditional point of view on covalent synthesis, uh, like uh, changing uh, the ways in which atoms are connected one to each other. What I want to you is to see that chemistry is beyond the molecule. Everything, most of the most interesting uh, things in chemistry can be extracted if you change completely your, your uh, way of thinking uh, all this you know. And So let me see if this thing works. Um, let's uh, start a trip from the microscopic scale to the scale where molecules are located. So let's take this bus, basically from the size where another grad student is, okay, to the uh, order of magnitude at which molecules are. Here we know that chemistry uh, is dealing with uh, molecules which size comes from micrometers to uh, tens of uh, nanometers in this scale. Uh, but nanoscience and nanotechnology deals with bodies that uh, are located in this range, not precisely one nanometer, 1.0 nanometer to 100 nanometer, but it's something in this uh, range. We are flexible on that. I am a nanotechnologist, so uh, I know what I'm to you. So, but if we think about chemistry from a different perspective, we will realize that molecules are social, sociable. They interact between each other. And if you think about uh, think of it on this type of interactions, they are basically information. So molecules interchange information between them through something very basic, uh, basic. So we have this type of uh, channels of information interchange are called non-covalent interactions or supermolecular interactions. As an example, we have the classical ion-ion interaction uh, in which a cation attracts uh, an ion or a cation uh, repels a cation, same charges are repelled different charges are attracted. Uh, uh, but uh, we also have ion-dipole interactions in which depending on the uh, dipolar uh, moment of the molecules, then they can be rearranged around a particular charge as here a cation, a sodium ion. Uh, but the, uh, a particular case of these type of interactions is one of ones which involves Different other types of uh, attraction and repulsion ways between molecules in which we do not necessarily have a charged part in the molecule. So this means that molecules, ions, and uh, all sorts of uh, chemical entities can interchange inter uh, information at the short mid and long range, either in all the directions or to particular ones, such as 
this type of interaction, not cognitive interaction, it's a coordination uh, only. We know it. Uh, uh, we know this classical example, which is EDTA and uh, calcium. Uh, we also have H bonding, which is totally directional, uh, totally different from uh, the previous examples that I gave to you. Uh, we also have dipole-dipole interactions, which uh, we could see them as a partially uh, directional inter um, interactions. And also, we have uh, pi-pi interactions, ion-pi interactions. This is an example of cation-pi interactions. We also have the anion-pi interactions, which uh, allow to a particular molecule to have information interchange. But not only this type of uh, non correlated interactions are what uh, allow molecules to be social between them, but also their shapes. We can remember this molecule, this is uh, SDS. Uh, it, is, it can be seen as a sort of worm, I don't know, these worms that are in the, in the, in the soil. Uh, but this part is also charged, this part can have uh, one of interactions. And at the end, we also know that the, they can form micelles depending on how do we prepare them. That means uh, what process do we use in order to prepare solutions from these type of molecules. But also, as an example, benzene, which is basically a donut, you remember benzene could have pi pi interactions. It also matters what shape has this guy. So if we take into consideration these old channels of uh, ways in which molecules could interact between them, then we could design molecules that do what we want to do. That means we could design molecules that interchange information among them in order to play as we want them to do. So, uh, but is this phenomenon uh, something very, very particular or is a general rule? So basically, this is very uh, common phenomenon. You know this guy, DNA? DNA is a, is a clear example of this type of interactions in an in interchange of information. And so you could say uh, that uh, the information encoded in DNA is only based on the sequence between the four letters, A, B, e, C, G. But basically, this is not true. Uh, if we take only one single strand of DNA in, uh, in spite of the sequence that we have inside, the possibilities for hydrogen bonding between these molecules and all the molecules in the medium, then uh, we could realize that uh, there are several other ways in which molecules can inter interchange information. So what is our building tool uh, in order to design the molecules that uh, interchange information as we would want to do, uh, them to do? So it's basically using covalent synthesis. We design molecules. Uh, we do synthesis, every type of synthesis, depending on what type of molecules do you want to have. Uh, and at the end, we end up with the building blocks, such as in the Lego games. Uh, Lego bricks, and they do everything by themselves. Depending on how do you design them, these molecules can do everything by themselves. That means you introduce the information to the to a particular molecule by design, by chemical design, and then this molecule will do uh, structures at the nanoscale. But this is interesting only because of the final applications. Final applications are what uh, uh, provides the fuel to do research in this, uh, in this area. Um, but there is a very important question. Is it possible to control matter position down to the nanoscale by some type of systems that have all this information encoded in one single molecule 
That is, molecule, please, once you are here, please associate among others like you and do a repetitive pattern. We could see some examples, uh, basically done by uh, lithographic uh, methods, and we can see that at the nanoscale, we can build uh, nano cars, nano ladders, nano things like this, but, uh, this nano minor venus, venus and nano statue, and nano torito, uh, nano guitar, and, and, uh, and uh, nano avion, nano plane, okay? So, but, this is basically done by uh, techniques that uh, are. Do um, you remember how did uh, Michelangelo do the uh, this statue of this guy that is without clothes in the uh, like posing in this way? I don't remember the name. Uh, uh -huh. How did he do this when uh, in that time? So, can I make my Can anyone say? <coughs> By sculpture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Taking something harder than what do you want to process, and then at the end have a final uh, shape. Uh, this is basically a lithographic method. Uh, we can do uh, in general uh, shapes at the nanoscale doing, uh, in some ways, the same thing that David did. But the question is, can we do that, say, to, uh, can we do this relocation of matter also with allotropes of carbon, especially the nanosized ones? We can have these examples. Carbon nanotubes, graphene, fullerene. So carbon nanotubes are, are like this. Uh, I think everybody knows this. Uh, what what is this? This thing is this that not the not the chicken, but the, <laughs> the barrier here. Uh, if you run it up, then you have a carbon nanotube in which each edge is a carbon atom, and the hexagons are basically perturbated pi pi points. Uh, this is the graphene, the version of this guy ex extended, and the fullerene is basically a, a football. Um, they were isolated and described, as many of you will know, by, for example, carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, by Sumiro Iima. Is this guy, not this one? Uh, graphene by this very um, interesting method from, uh, by using uh, this transfer tape, by filling up uh, graphene sheets, done by Constantino Vassalov and Andre Gain. And fluorine by, I missed the rest of the pictures uh, from Harry Grotto and uh, Carl and Smalley, but uh, unfortunately he passed away in 2016. Um, but what about carbon nanotubes? Maybe they could be a good example to know whether we could relocate carbon allotropes in space at our will. Uh, we have two types, single wall carbon nanotubes, multi wall carbon nanotubes. Main characteristics are they can transport electrons from one point to another one. So what about graphene? Graphene can do the same thing. It can transport electricity from one part to the other one. Um, I will not go uh, deep in what is the mechanism in uh, electron transport in carbon nanotubes or graphene, but what I want you to have is a, a general idea of this. Could we do uh, this type of uh, matter relocation not only with uh, carbon allotropes, but also by uh, organic molecules, for example, or inorganic molecules? Well, depending on the shape of the molecules, they will, they will produce different types of forms at the nanoscale. For example, if we have this guy, um, a disc, a disc will form this type of pylos. 
we have a bar, a bar will form this type of association. If we have rings, rings will have uh, clustering in this way, etc., etc., etc. Depending on what type of uh, shape a molecule has, then we will have a different way of cell assembly, that is, association with itself. Uh, but this could also ha uh, happen not only with organic or inorganic molecules, but also with DNA. For example, can you see, guys, uh, what type of shapes do we have here now? Down here? You know what is this? A nanocoke. <laughs> this is a nano guy. This is a nano snake, a nano rod, a nano donut. Okay? And this is like a nano cage and a nano rabbit. All of them can be seen basically using uh, semi pro microscopy techniques, such as AFM. So, but they can also be formed by different molecules, more complex molecules from the bio <coughs> field. For example, depending on what sequence we have in a uh, particular strand of DNA, then we can have cell association in different patterns. For example, if we uh, designed a sequence like AAA 100 times then PPP 100 times then GGG 100 times etc. 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 then we will end up with a sort of a carpet, magic carpet made of DNA. This is called DNA origami. Okay, like this paper game from Japan. This, I, mean, I am sure everybody has seen uh, this type of things. But just scan the sequence of the letters, then you end up with a different shape. A nano star, a nano happy smile, a nano triangle, and another nano triangle. There are many of them here in the next as an example. But this is with biomolecules. What if we could find applications to this type of uh, uh, ways of modifying matter. Yes, this will open futures for nano machines. And I don't. I, when I am talking about nano machines, I'm not talking about some uh, nano robot that will uh, end up destroying all the world. And no, no, no. I, am, I mean something small that do that does any work that does some work. Okay, so for example, some sequences of DNA that change their conformation upon change of pH. So that's a nano machine. You, you add a fuel which is pH, and the molecule does what it wants to do depending on this external stimuli. Uh, in this way, for example, we could do a moving nano person. Maybe you can see it here. <coughs> uh -huh. This is a, an open arms nano person, and this is a closed arms nano person. In which uh, this guy does this movement by changing the amount of magnesium chloride in the solution. Uh, but if we engineer more complex system, then we could find that we can have three-dimensional objects. This is some work very uh, 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 extensively exploited by a colleague in Freiburg, Andreas Walter, in Germany. But we could also find applications not only in the future. We could also find applications now, in the present day. For example, I really think that everybody has seen this TV. I am not doing any uh, commercial TV. I am just showing this as an example. Okay. So these TVs are uh, using quantum dots. Quantum dots are this type of nano uh, particular nanostructures, and my contacting nanostructures made of uh, carbogenides. Uh, but also we can have examples of carbon nanotubes being used in cell phones in smartphones, so uh, in the annual part of uh, uh, the light emitting diodes uh, uh, installed in each cell phone, depending on the model, of course. But 
carbon nanotubes can also, and now are being also used to do special materials that are called uh, um, nanocomposites. Nanocomposites as part a mixture of some type of material with another type of material, which is at the nanoscale. Uh, as an example, we have, um, I will, can I say brand? Can I use brand here? No, I, I will not uh, use brand here, but there is a brand of cars that uses carbon nanotubes in the circuitry inside of many systems. Um, uh, in my classes, I always use that example, and I can say brand, but here I, I don't know if it will be exclusive to the, to the rest of the world. So. Uh, but also, Carbon nanotubes in plastics are used to uh, enhance the mechanical properties of this type of thing. I don't remember the name in English. It's, it's thick, okay? Um, but also to obtain uh, stiffer materials that can be used in a more challenging environment, such as these uh, windmills, to produce uh, eolic energy. Um, but also in all the many other examples uh, of currently commercialized materials. Uh, for example, one of these type of um, nanocomposites was developed uh, with a, a collaborator from Kapoyen. Kapoyen is a very small town in Germany. Uh, it's a very, 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 very small town in Germany. I can uh, work from one point to another one in 20 years. Uh, uh, okay. But this type of uh, nanostructures can also be used not only in order to develop new materials, but also to do nanosensors that make, for example, make it possible a real time detection of pathogens. That means Using carbon nanotubes, you can enhance the sensibility uh, of particular sensors. You just only need to choose the correct uh, uh, sensing element, attach it chemically to the surface of the carbon nanotubes, and then, for example, detect uh, bacteria uh, in real time uh, by using potentiometry. Uh, this type of approach was extensively exploited uh, for some years uh, with this colleague at Tarragona. Tarragona is another town that is a very small town that is at the, co the east coast of Spain. Uh, they have a very, very, very good food. I, I recommend you to go there. Uh, but what else with this? What, what can we do with this? Then basically we can do our lives better because better communications means a higher quality of life. For example, better nanosensors means that diagnostic systems could be cheaper and faster. Uh, a cleaner energy will mean uh, lower pollution. More resistant materials could allow you to have some uh, solutions that could uh, last for a longer time than traditional ones. But how did everything start? So if we go back to the Stone Age, we can see that everything was related to materials with humankind. Everything started with stones, then copper, then bronze, then glass and iron, then aluminum was basically processed in this. You see in which year are we now? So as long as we go in the time, then we see that the amount of materials done by humankind increases exponentially. Here, we have composite materials, the mixture of two or more uh, different materials with different properties, properties that open a mixture, you end up with a totally different property. But, Everybody called this part of the time as the Silicon Age. We know that silicon is located, uh, is used inside of computers, inside of cell phones, etc., etc. But now, after the arrival of uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology, 
we started with a new age that is the age of nanomaterials. Because also in these more or less in these years, supramolecular self-assembly arrived and was accepted as something that occurs with molecules. Uh, and we are currently, now this year, 2019, in uh, the age in which nano, bio, and multifunctional auto-organized assemblies can allow you to have things that do things, things that do interesting things. Let's see how time, how long time, uh, across the time everything was uh, evolving. Everybody knows that Sumio Ijima the, um, described single wall carbon nanotubes uh, and published a paper in Nature in, two, uh, in 1991. But a common idea is that this was the first time that carbon nanotubes were observed. This is basically a misconception. In 1952, in a Russian uh, journal, you know, in this time, there were two different worlds. Uh, the world was divided by uh, virtual and real vision. Uh, they observed, but briefly described, something that they called as uh, carbon fibers. But they did not describe them at the atomic point, uh, point of view. So they didn't know that they were multiple carbon nanotubes. Everybody uh, realized that they were carbon nanotubes many years later. And, but this is an interesting story. Then in this year, quantum dots were discovered, single world carbon nanotubes uh, by Sumi Yujima here, and graphene in 2004, uh, totally isolated and fully described. But what is this? Uh, what could you do with all this information, with all these materials, with all this way of uh, reorganizing matter? Uh, if you use, for example, a multidisciplinary scientific engineering approach for obtaining molecules and uh, basically using this type of a uh, nanotechnology approach that is the bottom-up, which is a chemical approach, you can synthesize building blocks which can carry out supramolecular self-assembly. In order to know what these type of molecules could do at the nanoscale, we have two options. Use current uh, characterization techniques or also use virtual microscopy as in molecular dynamics and molecular mechanics. A combination of both are what uh, allows us to really know what is occurring downside <coughs> at a nanoscale. And an example of this uh, approach of designing little box, uh, studying what they could do depending on the information that is in, uh, included in, the, in a particular molecule is this. Uh, 2D and 3D neural patterns by uh, self-assembly. This is uh, everything started with a problem. Can we have interconnected molecular systems which uh, could be potentially used in a future in nanoscale circuitry? Possible solutions at that time were you can connect covalently different molecules uh, or either uh, connect multi-compartment micellar scaffolds using non-covalent interactions, as these guys. But is it possible to produce long-range networks uh, using only self-assembly patterning, but only using one single building block? The answer was this molecule. Uh, she's a uh, collaborator and also a wife. Uh, um, uh, the answer came up when we observed that this molecule can do uh, this type of patterning in a drug cast solution. We can see the scale. Basically, this is a nano wire, this is a nano ring interconnected by another nano wire, another nano ring. 
Another man of white print, white print, white print, white print. This is a two-dimensional network, but also it's a repetitive pattern because you can see that it is repeated at surface at surfaces higher than uh, ten thousand micrometers square. So the advantage of this is that it will be done at room temperature in the real time and is similar to an artificial 2D network of neurons. Why neurons? Okay, maybe we can not see the connection, but this is the, uh, what parts of the neurons you have? Hmm? Axons and dendrons, okay. This is a tendon, uh, an axon, and the central part will be the tendon. Uh, okay. Let's see a uh, magnification of this uh, guy. We can see some sort of regular organization this in this part. Here we can see that this, this is semi crystalline at this location, a semi crystal, and then this type of ring connected by another by the other guys. How did we synthesize this molecule? Uh, basically, first we obtained this ketamine, and then <coughs> by um, uh, a selective introduction of aldehyde here in this part, we used this as a hinge in the molecule, and then by using the two uh, equivalents of this guy and one equivalent of this hinge part then we could have a molecule that can fold itself at a certain degree, according to uh, molecular dynamics predictions. And we, cannot, uh, we can end up with its uh, coordinated version, and we could also introduce different types of metals here. But can we tailor the self-assembly uh, in this molecule? Yes, by switching the solvent using that is playing with uh, the electric constant, evaporation rates, and also the type of the surface, then we, can, we would have different ways of association. Here we have this type of networks, not only uh, by the ligand, but also with the guy that has two metals inside here. And if you use a do another uh, solvent, then you have totally different ways of self-assembly. But what is the reason, the key reason for this type of association? By doing an, uh, a screening between different types of stru molecular structures, changing uh, different parts of this molecule, we realized that the key part was this. Here is a phenyl, and this is a methyl. Okay? So, what is occurring down there? Uh, pi pi interactions addressed to a particular position depending on what type of electric constant you have. Uh, I already told you that uh, molecular simulation can be can allow you to have uh, a view of how molecules are inside uh, are down there. So basically, the molecule is this a wedge configuration. Using uh, atomic form microscopy, we could see that the nano rings were basically a donut, a nano donut. Using high resolution TEM and uh, electron diffraction at that scale, we could see that the Nanowires are semi-crystalline. But also, we thought, can we do these networks inside of a polymer matrix? We did a picture, polymer uh, and this molecule, using the solvent that produces these type of patterns. And at the, at the end, when we cut slides of these type of samples, we saw that we have these rings, the same rings, the nanowires all uh, across the matrix, that means three-dimensional networks. The mechanism, vesicles. Everything started with vesicles. So first the molecule produces vesicles that upon collision, they uh, end up by, uh, with a pinhole produced in the center of them. 
and then the question of matter uh, trans uh, transported everything to the ring parts and the rings upon construction allow well, uh, a place for the nanowires to grow. It was basically the same mechanism uh, in, the, in a polymer matrix, but we could, uh, could not understand totally whether this uh, could be applied to do something useful. When we introduce carbon nanotubes in this type of system, we could relocate position of carbon nanotubes. Every, each part of this is a carbon nanotube in order to uh, do uh, networks of carbon nanotubes, not, also, not only in surfaces, but also in a polymer matrix. This is a polymer matrix with no molecule introduced inside. This is a bis sulfur molecule. And carbon nanotubes are just bundles. And this is a, a, a part of the wire that has uh, relocated carbon nanotubes. And finally, we saw that you could enhance electrical properties. But when we explore the possible mechanism at the deeper way and what type of applications will this system have, we realized that this is a can you hear me? Yeah. This is a, a hierarchical mechanism. That is, the molecule self-associates at a certain level. Then, this type of association also self-associates at a higher level of organization, and then uh, and so on up to four levels of organization in a final material. So, what will happen first? These molecules disperse carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes, once they are dispersed by a self-assembled layer of this guy, start producing vesicles, the same vesicles that I described pre uh, previously. These vesicles are responsible for, for transport, for transporting carbon nanotubes to a particular position. Once these uh, carbon nanotubes are transported through a similar mechanism as this vector tape, you know vector tape is in that. Uh, these vesicles, upon their existence, then when solvent is continuing in, in its evaporation, they produce toroidal intermediaries, uh, and finally, nanowires in the contact between these toroidal intermediates. So at the end, you end up with ordered and oriented carbon nanotubes in a system, which allows you to increase electrical properties, but also <coughs> Optical properties. So basically, uh, the visible and near infrared region, uh, the absorbance was somehow acceptable and in some parts even better than in the thin oxide, which is really interesting for future applications. So the answers to all these questions were yes, we can introduce information in one molecule to tell this guy, do what we want to do, do what we want you to do, sorry, uh, through self-assembly that can be hierarchical from the nanoscale to the microscale to the mesoscale. In this way, we could tailor the position of uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, so you can uh, modulate the electrical and optical properties. And also, in uh, the end, enhance the macroscopic properties, which will be useful for future devices. So I want to thank you thank you for this invitation, to everybody for paying attention to me, and uh, also to the collaborators here and the uh,